procedures governing the preparation of the City Council agendas. Recent events have shown the need for a set of written guidelines to ensure City Council agendas are developed in a fair and equitable manner with respect to the addition of agenda items that do not originate from within the City's organizational structure. And this is not a final uh, draft by any means that was put out there, so it's something to chew on. Uh, I believe that the Chief wanted to talk about the Lexapol policy. Do you want to talk about that during work session? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. And uh, was there anything else? Dave, did you have anything for the work session? Mr. So. Mayor, I want to I want to talk about ICAC to the children's uh, international children's. Uh, the thing from Seattle. From Seattle. Please. Okay, that's on the agenda under new business. Okay. So we can do that then. And then uh, we also have a presentation from Mr. George Sharp, um, which is under old business, but if we wanted to spend some time talking about it at the end of the work session, we could open that up too. So let's, uh, let's see where we, how far we get. So 2019-2024, six year STIP. that on the work session and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll bug Director Cannon. Um, revenue raising options. So there's a there's a two-pager in here for you guys talking about. So we're mainly talking about street, money for streets, money for transportation. Uh, and I, I want to I want to explore more revenue, you know, and, and just I want to I want to you know, maybe even bring in some people to talk about how cities raise money and the different ways that they do it, just as an educational thing for everybody. But the my the main hope and the main desire is that we can find ways to uh, create some additional revenue to improve our streets. I think streets and sidewalks are something that we need to focus on. Really, I think streets, sidewalks, sewer, um, and anything else that starts with the nice. statement that I made. Exactly what I said. On what? Is it? <laughs> oh, hey, you can't you can't campaign during council meeting. I campaign. Get off your soapbox. Yeah. <laughs> right, really, but really, anything that starts with S, I think we need to stick with that. Streets, sewers, sidewalks. What else? You, know, you said you're going to curse, but don't do it. Okay, yeah, we could instead of sewers, we could say. Uh, you know, I'm hoping that that's where we can kind of shift our efforts. There's a lot of irons in the fire that we've got that are that are pretty well set and I, I think you know they don't necessarily have a life of their own at this point but they're you know they're 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 they've matured these ideas have matured and figuring out our sewer system which we're going to get a presentation on tonight not we have it figured out but uh coming up with a way to better fund it and better prepare for the future with it is what we need to work on and then our streets and our sidewalks so we can start by you know the, the fact is we don't have money to repair our streets and sidewalks, so we have to find money. Uh, finding an additional revenue stream, I think, would be a good place to start. And then with that, we can you know, leverage those funds into bigger and better things. There's a couple different things they're talking about. Transportation impact fees, <clears throat> local transportation act, uh, transportation benefit districts, local improvement districts. Um, I don't know if anybody had a chance to read it, but I would be interested in what Kind of thoughts you all have. I noticed one. Some of them were just for building new stuff. You can only use for building new stuff. For the There's impact some fees. And if some there's a work. business that comes in, yeah. the impact of that business is where you've got to make the investment. I see most of our immediate need is repairing streets and sidewalks versus needing the long <coughs> So I think we kind of have to look, kind of think about what what we want this money to go to. Is it primarily for fixing things that we already have or is Replacing maintenance operations. So yeah, so I think that does somewhat uh, tell us what, what options we can use. If I read the information correctly, but, well, you know. couldn't we say that replacing some of the side some of the sidewalks 
in downtown, especially the two blocks downtown, would be that we'd like to be able to use impact fees for that community because it is it's not a new business, but it is helping business when you because those sidewalks really do need to be replaced. They can't just be fixed, fixed. Yeah, I don't I don't I mean my understanding of like a transportation impact fee is if you get a new business or new development that comes in, you're saying, yeah. okay, that's gonna that's gonna increase the that's gonna you know create an impact on what we have or whatever, but it's, it's minimal because you're not going to get a lot. You know, we don't get that's continual. That's that way. That's exactly yeah. what it's that way. Those are one time kind exactly of pieces. I was just kind of hoping. Yeah, but I think that, you know, I would point towards the transportation benefit district concept and the, specifically the, the sales and use taxes. Um, in my mind, that spreads the, the tax out to people outside of just the city. You know, if you're, yeah, if you're, yeah, it's, everybody drives down the road. If you're, you know, if you live off Scoop and Chuck, you're driving on Tenino's roads to come in and get your mail, and you're also going to go to the grocery store. And that's, that's a way to spread it out to everybody that travels through town and not just funding the streets primarily through property taxes. So it seems, I mean, that seems to be a fair direction. I don't, John, you've had thoughts and tirades on transportation benefit yeah. districts in the past. You do the math in, in Tamino, and even to raise enough money with the transportation policy, uh, transportation benefit district, you're looking at a bare minimum of 10 years. Never mind that they keep raising it up. This right here, to me, especially when they first brought it up, was because the state didn't want to handle that, didn't want to handle all the requests anymore, especially from jurisdictions like ours. Uh, and same thing with uh, sewer systems. If you remember, I, I do believe you were here, there was a group that tried to form a bunch of small cities together so that we could work and get money to repair and expand whatever needed, for example, like our sewer system. And that never went anywhere. And it, during the time that I sat here, I've watched the state slough responsibility off to the smaller jurisdictions one at a time. The larger jurisdictions, and let's say stick with Thurston County, at least in Lincoln and Tumwater, uh, they have a better opportunity because of their business base to go ahead and do this. Uh, and once it's set in, you have the initial the initial group of people that are going to yell and scream because you're looking at an extra 50 bucks. The state's already put on. I'm not talking about the, the license about fee. Well, it's that's, not all license fees. No, it's not all. Yeah. But that's the biggest part of it. It says so right there. You can, Once you look at the rest of it, you're looking at much smaller stuff. You can impose a $50 fee, and it used to be 20 just on the license. It's not saying what you can do with the rest of it. You, you're looking right now, we're, we're between a rock and a hard place. You look right now, we got $5.4 billion in new taxes coming down the pike, and we haven't even seen them to seen them uh, begin. Uh, you've got fire departments, you've got the schools, you've got everybody that's going to be trying to go out for more money. It's going to come to a point where people are going to start saying no simply because they just can't afford it. So I don't know how we're going to come up with any more money. Uh, I'm not in favor, and you know me, I'm not in favor of raising taxes unless it, it is, it first goes off to a vote of people, like we did with the B and O tax. I was surprised that everybody said do it. That didn't go to vote. No, not a vote of the people, but That's, all the businesses. Yeah. All, all the businesses said, yeah, do it. The people that were directly affected, yeah. they said do it. Uh, the only one that did was uh, Scotty's, and I think it's because he didn't know what was, what was happening at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, he was out, out of, out of the, the county more often than he was in during that time frame. But the business community said, yes, put a no tax on this. That surprised me. Uh, if we go down this road of the transportation uh, benefit district, I would not be in favor of us just imposing, as it says right here, that we're allowed to. I would say go out to a board of people, a good solid message so that when we say this is what the money is going to, 
we can show them that's where the money goes to. I've always believed and always said that if you can show the citizens that you're asking to get the money from, this is exactly what we're going to do with it, and you do it, you won't have a problem. But if they don't believe that the money's going to go where it is, you're going to have a problem. What about the voted uh, uh, sales and use tax? That's what I would like to explore. Yeah. I'd like to explore uh, the, you know, our sales tax is super low in general. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's almost two points right? lower than anything else. 15 miles up the road, we're paying 9.3 when we go to Tumwater. Yeah, so, so ours is super low, so there's a lot of room there. Uh, and we're not even going to be... Which, you know, is something, which is something that I brought up a while ago. Yeah, so what I'd like to explore is tacking that 0.2% that onto the local sales tax. And then, you know, it's not going to bring in millions of dollars, but what it will bring in is a revenue stream where maybe, you know, maybe we use it to uh, get a, a public works loan and pay on that loan because we're going to do some type of street repairs. Or maybe we use it to collect money for a grant match or something. Or it's, <coughs> that's what I said earlier. My little diet mm -hmm. track is that uh, it's it's going to be really difficult to come up with enough money if we get the benefit district. But yeah, you won't just get money in the in the coffers to immediately pay for things. But if we go out to a board of people and ask them, if you ask for two percent, I don't think that's going to fly. That's point two. Point two. Point two is a whole other thing. <laughs> point two is the max. Eight percent. It's it's point two is the max. Okay. Yeah. yeah. If you go out to a board of people and explain to them, this is money that's going to be set aside so that we can find matching, use it as a matching fund, and explain what all that means, you've got a much better chance. But, but they have to understand that this is money that we're putting together so that we can look around and say, we can, mat we can now meet a matching fund. Yeah, our, our current street fund, we have $90,000 in it. Uh, of which sixty thousand a year is spent. You know that's just, and that's just uh, employing people to fill potholes and sweep streets and that 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 doesn't give us any money to actually make any investments yeah. in our in our infrastructure. So. I don't like the sales tax. Uh, you do. Uh, I think that it, it, it spreads. Yeah, for years, the, I've said. The, you know, the impact. One of, one of the first things you heard me say was uh, about about doing this type of thing, coming out to the, to the public, asking them to increase the sales tax. We'll still have a lower sales tax yes, than any place else oh, in yeah. the county. The difference is, is we'll start capturing money from visitors mm -hmm. where we're not now. Yeah, which we're making investments in bringing in visitors. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's we need to capitalize on that, I, I think. Okay, so we will, if any, does anybody have any other thoughts on the local improvement? I think the local improvement district thing is, that's out of our league, not out of our league, but that's not worth the squeeze, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Did everybody have a chance to look over the wastewater, water management, waste and wa wastewater, water and wastewater services outli outline and proposal? Kelly will be here later to give a presentation. All right, I, my only question to you will be about the the uh, composting, because PSC has already asked, talked to me and said, hey, would you maybe be interested in doing some kind of energy project around composting, so there may be some opportunities for us to partner with like PSC for some kind of project, so. What? what? Digester? Or yeah, what? well, like the county did a huge study about South County and putting it mm -hmm. And they have money to create it, and they just, yeah. it's and it dropped. It just went away. On the line. So I think, well, yeah, Kelsey Hall's asked me to, mm -hmm. to get with her and just because they're interested in that. So there may be some opportunities there. I mean, if we can put that part of it off, <coughs> there is a little, I don't know what the plan is. That's not an immediate thing. The immediate thing is, uh, in will explain, is phasing in, a, 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 having, having a plan that starts off uh, decreasing the decreasing what's in the lagoon, right. but also with a plan to the future to make it to where it's a sustainable kind of. Process. So I just wanted to make, not make that the only option to see if so we come up with something else or maybe some other things yeah. we can do with partnerships and reduce the cost of actually implementing something like that. There's no shortage of human waste. Yeah, there is. anywhere. I mean, if we really there's there's so much 
room for big business and human waste. And that's what they're doing it. is, uh, I think in the county plan anyway, yeah. they were looking at uh, manure from the dairy farms. Mm -hmm. And the other thing we can incorporate is uh, uh, food waste from the uh, area. And the stuff that gets hauled Now in. incorporate so, human bodies. Yeah, yeah. human bodies. Yeah. That was passed in the legislature. So anyway, I'd just like to take a little bit longer look at that whole right. uh, composting part of it and see what's out there. And we may be able to get some funds from other places to help pay for it. So. Yeah. We've got three joints in one of the things. It's a bit off the this is where getting ready to start developing out there is one last flight. pushing to change the rules and regulations on the on the purple pipes. Right now, the way that they've got it set up, it makes it extremely expensive because you can't put them together, mm -hmm. and they won't even let you put the purple pipe underneath the, the, the clean, clean water. And if it's underneath the clean water, gravity's going to keep the two separated. Doing that, where you can put both lines in at the same time will save a lot of money. Yeah. So we need to figure out who we need to talk to up there to get start getting that change. Department of Ecology. Is this just a contamination thing with pipe yeah. or something? So since, since the state, the, the feds are very interested in um, the ag part, I think we get a little help from them. Yeah. So there's a capital investment estimate of $1.8 million. Don't let that, I mean, don't let that don't let sicker shock you know, shy you away. When we had the feasibility study I had done, I think it was like 15 million. Something crazy. Yeah, yeah. it was something crazy for the Cadillac version of a of a septage receiving facility. Um, Kelly has a plan to do this kind of kind of phase this in. Uh, we cannot set up a system that receives septage until we decrease what's in the lagoon. Um, the different concepts kicked around for decreasing what's in the lagoon. Where you know the, the easy answer is just start trucking out what's in there, but then you're filling up you're filling up trucks with water, and we have a facility that treats water, so you know sending away a truck full of of dried or squeezed cake, de dewatered poop, is cheaper than sending away a truck that is like water, ninety percent water. Yeah, ninety percent water. So a lot more out. Yeah, so getting a getting a dewatering device is very expensive, you know, somewhere around half a million dollars for a used one. Uh, Kelly believes that by us telling, by him going out and talking to his, uh, his, you know, whatever associates in the dewatering industry, he thinks that he can get one brought down here for a trial period of you know like six months to a year where we could be dewatering the, the cake shipping it out while decreasing what's in the lagoon to create capacity to then be able to take in the septage from septage trucks so we hopefully we would get this dewatering device this belt press down here for free on a trial period to see how we like it while it's here use it to dewater the cake and then when the capacity is in, is created in the lagoon it would give us the opportunity to create that additional revenue stream which you know for for Laconer is like three to six thousand dollars a day which would help give us the money to then create the additional things we need so that's all that. there's moving parts but he's here to give us uh, some boost of confidence that they know what they're doing and he's, he's the one that worked with him on the Laconer one, right? Yeah, so he, he runs the Laconer site, yeah. So he knows what's going on. You went up to those, I think. No, we sent Troy and Millard and who else went? Did you go over there? No, I didn't go up there. No. I know we sent something. Yeah, yeah. So that will be talked about. Well, we already know that it will work once we get the, the levels down because. Uh, Wastewater management up in that in North County. They don't want to do it yeah, that feasibility study that we had done, it you know they went out and they talked to commercial septage folks, and they they determined that there was a market for it. Yes. Yeah. You know that that was really all we wanted from that study. <coughs> Maybe something like that that works and it works and it should. That means we should be generating enough money so we don't have to increase rates anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know if you, both of you were here 
I think lot downtown takes some right now. That's it. But they really don't want to do it. I think they got busy enough. You know what we're it. talking about? We say septage. So uh, septic trucks that come in pumped septic tanks. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you see, you see driving around. Mm -hmm. They they have they come and they pump out the septic tank and they have to take it somewhere to a, to a facility and they have to pay to offload it. We're a facility, but we don't currently allow for them to come in and pay to offload it. The only places they go are, uh, you know, there's like Puyallup and Olympia, and then some place in Centralia, some place in Centralia Chehalis that sometimes is shut down because it's like kind of sketchy. Because there's the us. No. No, they pay us. They would pay us to offload. With us, with us drying this, it, 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 that would allow them to come in. Is that mm -hmm. why we're not, see, that's why we're not taking it yeah. out. There's so much poop in there. Yeah. Pretty yeah. exciting stuff to talk yeah. about. Yeah. Half of this from Houston to get <laughs> Three quarters of it. And it was fine until Don Wands came into town. <laughs> yeah. And it just got crazy. <laughs> so maybe the idea is they could probably a lot would stop doing it if they had other places to do it. So They charge a lot, and it's a pain in the neck for yeah. trucks to get in and out of there. So it seems like there's a big demand from what we got. We make some really cool t-shirts. Yeah, yeah. 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 All right. Well, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> we have a break between. I'll tell you what. I know somebody that worked a lot with his. He had one on his truck, the sticker. Okay. I won't do it. All right, recess. <laughs> uh, the administration would like to propose the adoption of a set of procedures governing the preparation of the city council agenda. Recent events have shown the need for a set of written guidelines to ensure city council agendas are developed in a fair and equitable manner with respect to the addition of agenda items that do not originate from this within the city's organizational structure. So it's somewhere in here. Uh, yep. So we want to we want to give staff some guidelines and some help on how to uh, deal with the creation of the agendas. Uh, most of most of what I read in here I, I like and I'm comfortable with. Uh, I don't I wouldn't want to create anything that's too strict or too structured because I think sometimes you know one of Tonino's greatest assets is being able to be uh, flexible, but we we do want some guidelines set down. Uh, that isn't to say that you can't take a vote to suspend the rules at any time and do whatever the heck you want. Yeah. The reason that I have a problem with this mm -hmm. is because... Are you lost? There you go. The reason that I have a problem with it is because all of a sudden it's, whether you're the mayor or 10 years down the road, so whoever at next is mayor, this kind of ties their hands, saying you have to do it this way. I don't like tying the administration's hands and saying you have to do it this way. While you're mayor, if you choose to go by these rules, you have that authority to do that. You don't need us to say this is what, it's nice that we're getting the information mm -hmm. that this is what you'd like to do, but you have that authority. So it doesn't have to pass. Oh, it could be also. an executive order, well, you know. Yeah, it, it doesn't have to come to us to pass. now. Once the agenda comes to us, we can change the agenda. Yeah. Okay. So, like, like the one meeting that I think you're talking about, where it just went on and on, and everybody got heated. Uh, that's something that you could have taken care of before. It wasn't no big deal, uh, but it's still that's your realm. Yeah. But when it comes to us we still have the ability to say, well, we want to add this or take this out and mm -hmm. make the amendments, and as long as everybody agrees to an amendment, then that's what the agenda becomes at that point, okay? So I would be against bringing this to any kind of a vote simply because the system that we have is a strong mayor system and this weakens the system. Okay. I'm not against just making this an internal kind of thing, you know, that, well, you, have that, that, you know, like, I think having, limiting to two presentations per meeting is probably a good idea. 
and then saying, you know, and, and then saying, you know, let's let's try to keep it at 20 minutes. This is mm -hmm. it. And again, uh, as the mayor, yeah. you have that authority. You know, the 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 you have the main step. If you want it to be 15 minute presentations, 21 minute presentations, just two presentations per meeting, then that's how you build your agenda. Yeah. You don't have to ask us. I think when a you know citizen comes in and you know demands, I want to be on the next agenda. I want to talk about this. Uh, you know, if we, you know, and if we just do it internally, we'll accomplish the mission. Yeah. But just being able to say, hey, look, you know, we're already booked out for the next, you know, three meetings, four meetings, and this is why yeah, you can't fine. be on a presentation until January. It's not because we don't like you, we don't value. It's because we're not going to spend six hours in meetings. Yeah. See, and, and you don't. Again, you don't need us to do yeah. this. And granted. It doesn't, it ties to a degree and it doesn't because you, by law we can't make any rules or regulations that's going to tie anybody's hands. The next generation of council people, we can't tie their we hands. We can, we do it all the time. Yeah, but it can be untied. Yeah. And why tie the hands when you don't need to in the first place? Okay. Oh, well, that's good. Good points. All right. Chief, did you want to come up and talk about the Lexapol shindig? Yeah. Is it hot in here or is it just me? It's hot in here. It's hot in here, Chief. Um, Don't listen to that. I'm dying. Yeah, I'm getting my own homes right here. Okay, can you hear me? Um, good evening, Mr. Mayor, Distinguished Counsel Robert Swain, your police chief. Uh, I'm pretty excited to present. Uh, this is uh, the first copy of 10 of the uh, Tonino Police Department professionally done uh, policy manual. Everything you wanted to know about the police but were afraid to ask is in this book. And uh, I'm going to pass it around here so you could kind of thumb through it. But um, John Steins put in over about 200 hours into getting this put together. and. Uh, after review by several people, it's a, a book of best practices for police in 21st century policing. And so I'm pretty proud uh, in my first year here to get this one big project done and it puts us well on our way towards accreditation, which council knows that's where I want to eventually get to. So Lexapol uh, is going to continue to now do our, our daily training bulletins for us and then we're uh, starting to work on a uh, operations manual that will address procedures and uh, not policy. And the policy manual, you'll see, uh, is not in conflict with the city's handbook, uh, but they kind of mirror each other and there's cross-references in there. So, uh, but any questions about this before I let you come through it? Uh, you can read this one. No, there's, there's, you can't read, you gotta read. I see. So, uh, the, the gotta read is in this one. Okay. Yeah. We are going to put it on the, uh, the website. Uh, probably not the whole thing, but some of the areas that the community may want to know about the police department and how we do things. So, uh, there's nothing, uh, secret about this. Our tactics or anything are not in here. They'll be in the procedures manual, which will be confidential, but uh, I'm going to share this with our community so they know that we have these in place and we actually have rules and regulations. So. That's great. Thank you. What does the training look like for our officers once this is implemented? We are going to... Um, I meet with the staff once a month, and so during that time, uh, it's about a two-hour meeting, we will be discussing uh, these policies, but uh, throughout this coming together, everybody on the force has had an opportunity to see this before it's ended up in its final format. And so I, I, I do see this as a team effort on our part, on putting this together uh, and, and getting it down to, it's just the City of Tenino Police Department policy manual. And of course, I've already been contacted by a city uh, to uh, they want to they want to copy it. Um, uh, I won't mention names. Yelm, uh, 
<laughs> and, uh, and so we'll we'll uh, we'll see if we if we can't do a little law enforcement sharing here. Um, but again, uh, I want to no, thank. If they send us some reserves for the Oregon Trail days, yeah, yeah, we we'll, gotta be a little we'll, reciprocity. Yeah, we'll, we'll we'll work something out. Uh, but I do want to thank uh, the mayor and council uh, for your support in this endeavor. It's been uh, a long time coming, and it's going to be so much easier to update in years to come that uh, when I'm gone, uh, the next chief won't have to start from scratch like, like we did. So I'm pretty happy with it. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. I think one of the things that I know when our policy manual, that Lex Lexapol thing, there was kind of a process for reviews too. So there was kind of a schedule set up where mm -hmm. different sections would be reviewed throughout a year. So you don't have to read the whole thing at once. You do a whole review this one, this, right. you know, so. There, there's even an app keep, yeah. on a phone where yes. you pull it up and once a week you go through like six policies and take a test and, and, whoosh, and so we know that you, it knows that you them. reviewed them. And, you yeah. don't have that? No, we do. Yeah. Of those seven, so, yeah. It's slick. So yeah, that's so, a that's a nice set. For which section am I gonna to have to read? You don't need to right now. <laughs> yeah, no. I just wanna get clamps. Hey, what section am I going to have to read? I think there's a section there of volunteers. Seventeen. B. Seventeen. It's only close to twelve. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> 17. Okay, uh, you got it. next up, Mr. George Sharp. You want to come up and talk about your uh, give your update on the creative district? Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council Members. I believe John Millard put in your packet the executive summary yep. for the creative district. There's <coughs> only 11. <laughs> Page 32. This is what we're bringing before you tonight for your approval for moving forward with asking to apply for certification. We will submit a letter of interest to the Washington State Arts Commission. The mayor will submit that letter of interest. But I wanted to share with you kind of the information that's gonna be in the front of the application that the official name of the district will be the Tenino Creative District. The boundaries that we're suggesting are again the corner of Sussex and MacArthur. That's where the blue building is on that end where the bluebird new Bluebird uh, Birdhouse guy is. So it's right at that corner, and then going all the way to the corner to where Valley View uh, on that end of the road is, incorporating all those so that art artists and creative industries can locate in those areas. The Tenino Creative District shall be organized and operated by the City of Tenino. The City Clerk Treasurer will provide administrative support and coordinate logistical support of the Creative District and he will work with the, under contract with the Thurston Economic Development Council, Experience Olympia and Beyond, and your SCJ Alliance to your planner. It's estimated by John that he'll spend 5% or up to eight hours per month, and then the rest of our organization will spend up to 60 hours per month in supporting the creative district. We also plan to be supported by the Tenino Area Chamber of Commerce, continue to work with the task force that we have in place, other nonprofit organizations and the official city commission to be developed at a later date. The second page is the short term goals and the long term goals that we've established, and we'll flesh those out to even further for a business plan on three to five years. And then the next page is the proposed budget for that. There is a match that the city has to do to enable to get the Washington State Arts Commission $5,000 grant. The city has to do a minimum of $2,500 cash match, and then they can also do a $2,500 in-kind match, which we're gonna utilize some of John's time for the in-kind match. We minimum fundraising, and then in-kind, we anticipate having about 100 hours a year through the task force and volunteers. Right now, the state is 3172 for the volunteer rate, and that's actually from the federal, so I need to confirm that the state qualifies that from the Arts Commission. In kind of meeting room used for the task force, use this room for one of the things. We also have been using the Sandstone Cafe for meetings, and we have a couple other venues in the downtown area that we think that we'll be able to do displays. 
classes and workshops that are currently they say they will provide those in kind to us. And then again, work being done underneath the contracts of Experience Olympia and Beyond, SCJ and the EDC on marketing, signage, and other facilities to determine. So total income, both in kind and cash, would be 14772 <coughs> And then for the expenses, the contract for services to implement the Tenino Created District Plan of $5,000, and that's intended to be contracted with the Thurston Economic Development Council to implement that. The Creative District Development Activities, signage, tents, marketing, supplies, venue, rental, equipment, production costs, $5,100. And that includes the wayfinding signs that get, that you put in place. Those kind of things can be used as match for in-kind. And then again, in-kind volunteer support, in-kind meeting use, and uh, venues for displays for the total expense, 14772 Then at the bottom that says the city will support the creative district with be at annual appropriations in the amount that accords with the city's annual municipal budget, the city will also apply for grants to support the Tenaito Creative District. Thank you. This, this is excellent. Is excellent. Yeah. So, uh, just so everybody's clear, we, we intend to use that $5,000 grant to sign a contract. An additional, not, not, we already have a contract for the EDC. This would be above and beyond yeah. that. And it would essentially employ George to continue uh, working the creative district. So I, I'll be the assigned staff member from the EDC through study to the creative district yeah. project. So if we adopt that resolution tonight, we would be accepting all of this, including the budget, and uh, we're ready to do it. George, you have a fundraising here of hundred dollars. Does that mean that's just a, an idea? Well, Do you I already have uh, ideas for yeah, fundraising. Yeah, we created the Tenino uh, lasered sign, and we have ten of those. We've sold three so far. The net profit of that to us is fifteen dollars, so we've raised forty-five dollars with that. And then if we sell more of those signs that will go for that. I also see that we'll probably do coffee cups and other things that have Tenino brand on them, and the funds will come to the Creative District. Those signs are available at the Aaron Oaks Boutique. Because that, what I was well, thinking yeah. is uh, a yearly masquerade. I've met some, Wayne and I saw and met mm -hmm. a bunch of the uh, board members, and I think they would be more than up for an artistic uh, type of uh, masquerade party. To do fundraising. Yeah, we look at all options and do pros and cons and what what we anticipate to make money out and how much it costs to put them on and timing. Mm -hmm. Cool. Any other questions for Mr. Sharp? Looks good. I appreciate your work. You've been on it. For sure. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thanks, Thanks. George. Okay, um, so that, that's it for the uh, official work session topics. I've got a couple others. Uh, so Stein's putting in all that time. Do we have any uh, any any thoughts on like recognizing that effort? I'm going to get him a plaque. Okay. That I would like to present in front of council. That would be excellent. Yeah, it's not, he's he's done a fantastic job. He has. The caboose. So the caboose is here. I don't know if everybody is aware of that. It's at the Public Works building. Okay. So it's not it's not ready for prime time. It uh it had it, it was touch and go getting it down here. Uh, the the shipping costs got as estimates got as high as twenty thousand dollars to get it down here, and Public Works staff did an excellent job, stepped in, and uh, they took the the bull by the horns and did the shoring up underneath the caboose and putting in the beams and stuff that were going to cost a lot of money. One of the companies wanted to weld all these beams in there. Uh, we shopped around a ton. We got it done for 12 9 It was brought down here. Uh, so it's here. Uh, That's, not the check. That's not the voucher. We just, it was 14 something. Yeah. Probably with taxes. Okay, with tax. Okay. okay. All right. So that is that is what it got. That's what it took to get it down here. It's down here. Now we have to figure out how to start refurbishing it. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a different animal. It's a, you know, if you, anybody that's ever restored an old car, I, which I have never done, but I imagine a car from the 50s is pretty difficult to restore. This is a car built in 1923. Built out of wood? Out of wood. Well, that shouldn't be too hard for a 
No, we've got people that can do it, but what I'm saying is, it, it's gonna take yeah, it's going to take some effort, it's going to take some time, and, you know, it's going to take some money, but, you know, we're going to figure it out. We probably can get the money to, uh, to help fix that from the historic, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. historic grants, port money, yeah. uh, some of the businesses have offered to George. donate money. You know, Edward Jones, you put a little plaque on there, Edward Jones will write you a check. So, you know, we're flushing that out. Uh, Leslie is raising his hand saying he'll write a check. No, I'm saying, I'm pointing at George. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so we weren't ready to put it on the tracks. We were going to triage it, stabilize it, you know, make sure that it's it's ready to go out and not be a, like an attractive nuisance on the tracks. Uh, so you know, it, it'll you know it may during the winter be in the shop and something on a rainy day, and then something that volunteers. You know, I've asked Lynn to talk to Mike Meinberg, who's a master carpenter. To come in and take a look at it, Craig Kinnaman, who has his own uh, his own railroad museum next to Kippert's, uh, will come down and help. So we're gonna, you know, we're not ra we're not racing to get this thing refurbished and done. It's gonna be a it's gonna be a project for a bit. So, but it's there. If anyone wants, wants to go take a look at it, you don't sleep in it, whatever. <laughs> I'll just take a look at it. We should start renting it out right now. Yeah, rent it out right now. Yeah. There have been people that have contacted me about about doing what we said, having a contract with the city to rent it out. Um, so I mean, there, the, the concept is, is legit. We just got to get it presentable. How long? I know you want. You don't. I know you just say you don't want to rush it. But what's like your ETA for it? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I haven't even been in it yet. I went and looked at it and cried. And, <laughs> no, no. I, I, I drove by it and I was like, oh yeah, it's pretty rough. Well, when I drove by, just from the driving on the corner there, it looked good. But yeah, I was looking the pictures. On the list. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said. Yeah. Looking at it from that Put your fist through the wall. <laughs> the pictures on the on the during the pool. No, but the, the wood is, you know, but wood's easy to replace. Yeah. It's easy to replace siding, you know, so, you know, we go in, we start ripping the siding off, but then making sure we restore it in a way that looks period, yeah. The windows, all, all around the windows is rotten, so you push on a window, it might fall out. Uh, the interior was done up to be an office, not to be in the inside of a caboose, so we refurbish it. We want it to look cool, you know, look look like a caboose inside. What is it? Caboose look like in I don't know. I've been in a lot of caboose. Maybe set up like an office. Wasn't that where the engineer? <laughs> 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 you could, you could it was the repair shop for the trains. They kept tools and. Uh, yeah. Oh, is that where they? Is, oh, yeah. So I don't know. Knows that. I don't know. <coughs> yeah. Okay. Whatever. So we're working on working with the restoration warehouse and have the state pay for it. Yeah. For the grant. We'll find another grant. Well, I was thinking of having it done by Christmas. It'd be kind of fun to. Uh, during the Christmas tree lighting, have it like Polar Express kind of thing. That would be cool. Maybe well, a few Christmases for now. Yeah. Polar Express for now. Yeah. Yeah. The we'll state is going to call it DFT yeah. the next day repair the road. <laughs> All right. And then uh, the last item. So we've got in here, and I think there's no action that needs to be taken, I don't think, but the Facade Improvement Grant Review Committee. <laughs> uh, is kind of having some, I don't know, existential issues or some... Been listening to a bite. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that the... the, the, the I, I th they're making a lot... I, the, I don't, when I read it, I, I, I see that they're, like, I feel like they're, they're missing the intent of what we... Like, you know, like, we created something, you know, and then there's another group that's saying, well, this isn't right. No, this is what we created. So, like, our intent needs to be conveyed, and our intent is we've got money that we want spent to improve the, the facades of buildings. And that, in my mind, that includes signage, that includes bushes, that includes windows, window dressing. Outside. We did not, yeah, we did not specify anything. And, and then we you know, it was very liberal on what we thought would qualify. And you know we really wanted a clearing committee that would review it and, you know, and, and not tell people no. It was to maybe try to guide. Because, like when 
you know, when it was like, well, those aren't the right colors, or those, you know, that's not historic. Or more consistency. Yeah, yeah and maybe design, maybe some design concepts, but it's, you know, that there have been groups that have submitted for the grant, and they have said that they would like their match to be in-kind services, which is pretty standard. Yeah. And the and so the the farmers market said they want some benches. See, we could buy benches anyways, but they want benches, and they said their in-kind service would be cleaning up the street after their market and before their market and being good caretakers of Olympia Street. To me, that that sounds great, but. The facade improvement grant review committee is not sure that that's okay, but I think we need to just say, yeah, that's okay. I'll tell you what I told Kate. Kate wants a, a new bench out in front of her place. Okay. I said, <clears throat> your part of it could be in kind. Get your son out there to clean up your whole front of your building. Maybe paint the paint the siding a little bit, clean up the windows. That's what we want. That is what in kind is. Yes. And that's what I told her. She said, okay, well, that, if you can do that, then you're part of the... the, the yeah, we're looking to incentivize be, them. In yeah. yeah, doing stuff to that. Or, you know, like, or somebody, you know, I, I would love to see, like, a, a new sign, you know, the sandstone needs a new sign. And we say, okay, we can buy a new sign, but we want you to, you know, paint the front of your building was fresh coat of paint. You know, that, that seemed, I thought that was the intent. Is that? No. It's not. Somewhere along the line, somebody said, get out there and sweep the streets. That could be your in kind. Well, that's not what was meant when that was said. It was said, you, you do two thirds of the work, and we'll give you one third. Mm -hmm. I don't know where the two thirds and one third came from. Well, that's what it is, two thirds and one third. Who decided that? Well, it is, though. That's what it is. There's, there's just a two-to-one match. Where did that come from? Was that set by it the... It says in the, in, the, in the... resolution? Yeah, they have to... Yes. Okay. Yeah. But... If, 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 if they're going to get $1,000 from us, they're going to have to show... $2,000. $2,000 worth of in-kind. Yes. And that could be anything. So that would be 2000 and 3000 altogether. See. They're going to have to show that they've spent 2000 if they want 1000 They don't necessarily have to spend 2000 No, not, they can do that by... Sweeping the street. <laughs> or, it's just that that's or pruning the bushes. Or washing their own windows. Painting the outside of the building. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I know. And that, but when I talk to them about it, that's how I explain it. Mm -hmm. I don't say just go out and sweep the street. Because yeah, that's... Yeah. Somebody got that sticking in somebody's mind. That statement sweeping the street. Well, Why do they care? We want to give them, we want to make these investments in the facade. Yes, exactly. And we want a committee yes. that makes it like easy for that to happen. All right. If the two thirds is too much, I, I thought it was 50 50. You know, maybe we could change that. I mean, we could change this. It's a two to one. That, that's, that's I thought it was 50 52 when the Eagles did it. No, it was. No, it wasn't. No. No. We gave them, we gave them the whole $3,000 that they spent. Twelve, nine thousand, I think, is what they spent on that front end of their mm -hmm. building. And that's why they got the whole thing. Yeah, and that's why they got the whole thing. There was one other, if I remember right, there was one other, and they said, no, go ahead and give them, mm -hmm. give it all to them. Yeah, all, all, all the business owners, the yeah. building owners got together and said, yes, let's get that in That's what they said. Let's do the improvements there first. The street sweep in the streets is not bad enough. Well, you know, I mean, it, it, it's speaking, something that all of it just speaking, stuck in. Yeah, it's a sidewalk, it's like that. It's how yeah, they're yeah, sidewalks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We'll have another meeting. Really, I mean, really, if they're going to say, have I have no, if, if Joyce or whoever says, I'm going to, I'm going to get out and sweep the sidewalk, she does you know, all the time. twice a week, <laughs> yeah. you know, they, 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 they should be able to quantify that. Yeah. $30 an hour, uh, it's, I'm going to spend three hours a day sweeping oh, the sidewalk, okay. and I'm going to pull weeds. She can already what, claim that, because she does that, that, that too. You know, we're not, and we're not going to like 
we're not going to send an investigator out there to see, see how well they're doing it either. It's, when I was in Greece, they did the same type of thing. About 2 o'clock in the afternoon, everybody took a nap and for about an hour. Then they got up and, <laughs> and literally, they started cleaning the sidewalks <laughs> off, cleaning the gutter out before they opened up. Yeah. We're, we're talking basically the same thing. Yeah. But you think that these businesses would want to do this to make their business look nicer? Or and we're trying to further incentivize it by offering up to $1,000. Price goes, right? Because you do it to your house all the way to the corner. When she does it, she sweeps yeah. the gutter and the sidewalk in front of the O'Meara's building. And Barbara does it in front of the antique mall. Yes. So they already do it. So these, these, these applications that I read, are they approved or are they not approved? Oh, they're approved. Okay. Okay. Well, the, the post office, for instance, is one of them. Yeah. yeah. And they already did what mm -hmm. about fourteen hundred dollars worth of work mm -hmm. just pulling the bushes and stuff out of there. Mm -hmm. And that I didn't. Something that I didn't know was that the building is not own, it's owned by a private person. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. All the post office is lease that building. We're not kidding. That's yeah. a racket. <clears throat> so anyway, they're going to get their sign because mm -hmm. they've already done the in kind that's necessary. Yep. Yep. And who's the other one? I forgot. Farmers Market. Farmers market. And I, I don't, that's funny. We're gonna have another meeting. Okay, if you want me to come, let it. me know. I, I would love come. For you to come because I, I mean they're, they're 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 like interpreting our intent is what it seems like. And I'm like, well, yeah, I would like for you to be there. Yeah, it's we're it's fun. Till, we're gonna wait till John gets. I was back. I was thinking, you know, like you know, the pizza place, right? I, I go and create like this pizza, and I'm like, all right, guys, this is how you make this fancy new pizza. And then I come in like a month later, oh, and they're telling right. me I'm doing it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, no, I I created it. You can't tell me I'm doing it wrong. That's not how it works. You know, it's kind of what it seems like. You know, we made this thing, and now we're being told we're not doing it that way. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Is it 7 30? It's close. Everybody. Party time? Party time? Speak of the seven. <laughs> All right, we're going to take eight minutes for <laughs> Councilman Watterson to use the restroom. Now you say that. Oh, my God. <laughs>
to the June 11, 2019 Tonino City Council meeting. Let the record show that all council members are present. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Thank We have an agenda needing approval. Second. We have an emotion, a motion, a motion, not an e-motion. <laughs> and a second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion passes. We have the minutes from the May 28th meeting. Approval. Second. It is moved and seconded to approve the May 28th meeting minutes. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion passes. That brings us to the consent calendar. No problem. Thank you. This is the consent calendar May 29, 2019 through June 11, 2019. Payroll EFTs in the amount of $61,008.69. Claims checks number 28284 through 28328 in the amount of $64,149.43 for a grand total of $125,158.12. Is there any discussion? Along with Mill Lane wineries, which I thought we did last night. Yeah, last night. Yeah, well, I thought we did. Oh, we approved it pending them. So, well, we can just approve it again. So, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. All right, that brings us to. All right, I got a prize. So, what? Oh. So I went to the, uh, bill, the bill signing the capital budget, and I have the governor's bill signing pen to anybody that can tell me what year the Northern Pacific Railroad first used the name to 904 our depot, not for the city. The city That's was founded in 1906. Because there's a lot of different stories on that. No, nope. no, there is one official year. Get them blessed. 1906. No, that's when the city was that's founded. When the city was okay. founded. I'll say 19. Further back. 20. It's I'd say 1894. 1886, I think. Keep going. Yeah. That far back. 1872. A little further. 1873. <laughs> 72. Oh. Let's go here. In 1872. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, Northern Pacific Railroad founded the depot <laughs> and used really it and called it the Tenino Depot. Really which was before the city was founded, which also brings up the next thing. Uh, Rich Edwards, the city historian, has published his new book, The Naming of Tenino, in which he dives deep into Tenino's name origins, and he believes he has finally solved the mystery of where Tenino got its name. I'm not gonna, not gonna spoil it for you guys, no spoiler alerts. So you're gonna have to get this from Rich, and this is this is this is cool, you know. So we named him our official historian. Mm -hmm. So he did this with Tenino's name under our authority, going to the the archives and digging deep through like leather-bound books and scrolls and things like that. I think there was a wizard somewhere scrolls. that he worked with, <laughs> and uh, and it's cool. And he is going to be giving, going around giving history talks on this book, and. Uh, he will come before us. He had a surgery a couple weeks ago for uh, some issues, and when he gets better next month, he will come and he will uh, he can present this to us. But it's pretty okay. exciting. So know that those are out there. Yep. It's out. Are they for sale at the museum? They're going to be. He hasn't gotten there yet. He, he can't. He's still down for another four or five weeks. So once he starts able to move around again, that's when we'll probably bring him down. Um, yeah, sir. Oh, I didn't know. All right, that brings us to presentations. First presentation is Mr. Paul Brewster from the TRPC, who will deliver a presentation regarding Thurston Climate Mitigation Plan. Good evening. Is this my station? 
it is now. We don't have the press. Make sure your mic is on. Okay. Um, Can you hear me all right? Just give me a minute while I load this up. So, Council Member, do you, want, do you want to do your presentation first so you can get out on the streets? Yeah, real quick. Okay. Can, Mike, he, sure. can he give his? And I'll, yeah. and I'll get that. Do you think be here? So he's going to give his report yeah. real quick. I got it. And then he's got to go fight crime. Yeah. Big city of tonight. Yes. Mr. Mayor, uh, City Council, uh, Robert Swain, your Chief of Police. Uh, what uh, I'll be I'll be looking for this evening is for your support in. Uh, entering into an agreement with actually Seattle Police is the state lead for this. It's the International Crimes Against Children Task Force. What that does is it allows us to, uh, if we come up with a missing child or there's uh, some sort of uh, child crime that occurs where the child's a victim, it allows us to tap into those resources. And uh, there's, there's no money out for the city. It's a free service because of our partnership throughout the state. So I'll be uh, asking you to, to support me in moving forward with that. Uh, real quick, last day of school is Monday. Um, we are losing the principal and assistant principal. Rachel, let me know if I say something wrong here. Uh, assistant principal is going to Yelm. Uh, principal uh, Gary is going to Winlock as the superintendent. Uh, high school? Uh, the, of the whole district. Superintendent. Here is the high school. High school principal. principal. Yeah. Okay. yeah. No, principal. He's the principal. He's the principal. Uh, Ellen Cavanaugh has been the vice principal. Um, she's going to Yelm to be uh, a director in special services, yeah, something, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then um, I was told today that uh, there has been a hire for the principal of the high school for next year already. And it is a uh, person out of uh, Tumwater who's been the vice principal there. And so uh, she'll be now looking for her vice principal, and I'm sure they'll be busy all summer uh, trying to get things ready. I'm also going to share with council and the school board how many uh, direct incidents we investigated at all the schools uh, for the year. My purpose for doing that is not only to show that our SRO services and programs working, uh, but I also want to want to show you uh, some of, and share with you some of the incidents that occur with our with our kids. Um, it may surprise you, and uh, I I just think that council and the school board both should uh, work in tandem when it comes to uh, any any new ordinances that type of thing. Um, I do think that next year we need to address a couple of issues which I'll be bringing up to you, uh, not the least of which is a loitering ordinance uh, that would be effective, not what's on the books right now. So um, I'll, be, I'll be sharing that with you. Other than that, it's business as usual for us. We've been very busy. And uh, the Police Reserve Academy is in its 11th week. Got about uh, 10 more weeks to go and they'll graduate. Uh, we're pretty excited. We still have all seven with us, so everybody's passing their tests. Uh, this week will be a little rough on them because they start defensive tactics. That's where they are at tonight, is getting thrown around the gymnasium over there uh, underneath the stadium, but uh, they'll be better for the wear of it. So, um, Other than that, I, as I always do, I, I'm open for any questions, comments you may have. So you're looking at the loitering laws, how about vagrancies? Yeah, so uh, I'll be honest with you, uh, Mr. O'Callaghan, the vagrancy thing. So Yelm got one push through, and if you talk to the chief of police there, how he got it through, he'll tell you that he, he, he got it through because it was an off night. Um, uh, very, very big uh, political deal right now in Olympia, Seattle. Um, so uh, I, I will tell you that I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't support anything like that at this point in time. I think what we have in the books will work. We just have to be more uh, intelligent about how we do it. Okay. So then I have some ideas that we're going to try this summer.
Thanks. Anything you. else? Any other questions for the chief? What about uh, policies on the violence? Is that are we uh, are we doing any policy as far as um, violence that's happening in the schools? So uh, one of the things that. I've identified because this is my first full year of being here for schools mm -hmm. is there is no proactive program right now going on in the schools so you don't have gang uh, which I understand it's not a big gang community so but you don't have that you don't have dare which is drug resistance uh, which has changed uh, I know because I started it over again in Tulsa and it's more of a life skills thing so if I do anything that's actually the program that I'm going to recommend starting in the sixth grade on a, and that's kind of where I'm headed with that. I might want to get, uh, get help with be that because that's what, one of the things that they were supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And, the, and actually they were the ones that have uh, approached me about what, what program I'm looking at. And, and the D.A.R.E. program itself is very easy to start up. It's very inexpensive uh, for, the, for the city and uh, you know, it requires some additional training for a school resource officer. Uh, but I, I am talking to um, um, Joe about uh, our SRO services for next year. I would really like to have a full-time SRO officer dedicated totally to the schools. We are busy enough to do that. And uh, it's interesting that Rochester has a county deputy there four, four, four times a week. For the whole day, yeah. and so if they can do it, we can do it. And so I'm going to be I'm going to be coming back to you, asking if if I can move forward with Mr. Belmonte as long as he can find some money and we can find some money to do it. I've checked into the grants. I am going to apply for a, a grant here in a short time. I'll bring that to you. Uh, we have been approved for our bulletproof vest grant. So that's a 50% uh, uh, reimbursement on um, every time we buy uh, body armor, which is the most expensive piece of equipment that we buy. And so we, we will be uh, getting paid back by the feds at 50% of what, uh, what we spend for those. So there's the, that grant. Before you spend money on body armor, there's another company out there that's already been tested, uh, costs less, and has greater protection. I wish I could remember the name of it. I brought it to our last chief. Oh, but yeah, you, but they are out there. Yeah, if you find it, let me know. We 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 are a part of the. Um, we're part of the group here locally that we all wear the same vest. Yeah, I, I understand. And so uh, I'm just trying know. to say, like I said, what this vest does, it's lighter, it's stronger, and it costs less. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I'd be happy to, to entertain them. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Anything Thanks. Else? No. Thanks, sir. All right. Thank you. Mr. Brewster, you're back on. And you're, you're try to. Things all warmed up now. Mayor, Council Members, good evening. Um, last month at Thurston Regional Planning Council's Transportation Policy Board, Council Member O'Callaghan invited me to come down and deliver uh, the same presentation to you to talk about how the Thurston Region Climate Mitigation Plan may impact the city of Tonino. And so tonight I'm just here to give you an overview of this planning project and talk to you about what we're doing and uh, taking questions from you. So it's just warming up here. All right, for our audience members who can't see it, it you can turn your chairs around if you like. <laughs> it's right behind you. Um, so the Thurston Climate Mitigation Plan, it, it, it's a project um, that is being spearheaded by the sponsors of Thurston County and the cities of Lacey, Olympia, Tumwater. They have each contributed around $43,750 for a total of $175,000 to do the project. And they've contracted with Thurston Regional Planning Council that uh, is in many ways acting as a consultant, as a project manager to oversee the project. 
but also because of TRPC's role as a convener in, in long-range regional planning processes and our work on sustainable Thurston um, kind of made us a, a logical fit to assist these communities in the project and so I kind of want to talk a little bit about what some of the origins are of the climate work that we're doing in this region so the sustainable Thurston project um, which TRPC received funding from a sustainable communities partnership grant which is a combination of US Department of Transportation the Environmental Protection Agency and housing and urban development um, was around a two million dollar grant to do a fairly robust two-year process on looking out to the year 2035 across all of Thurston County to to look at what do we want to be like in, in that year close to 2035 2040 given population growth so we were expecting our county population to increase by another hundred thousand people so what does that mean for for housing land use, transportation, water quality for human consumption, as well as water quality for habitat for fish and wildlife. Um, and it identified 12 priority goals. And, and the one I want to point out is um, one of those goals was moving towards a carbon neutral community. And, and that identified um, some climate greenhouse gas reduction targets of a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions um, 25 percent below 1990 levels uh, by the year 2020 which is next year um, another uh, 45 percent reduction by the year 2035 an additional 85 percent reduction by the year 2050 and so needless to say um, we have a great level of effort required to achieve those targets because we're not even close to achieving our 2020 target of a 25 percent reduction So with that sustainable Thurston kind of, um, it identified the need to develop a climate action plan, but TRPC and the project partners have approached it in, in a two-pronged approach. Um, first is we, TRPC, uh, applied for and received funding from environmental, um, EPA to do a watershed-based climate adaptation plan. And so when we talk about adaptation, that's really like a coping, like it's, it's like risk reduction. It's like how do we cope with the effects of climate change that we're already seeing. So if you think about, for example, um, the last two summers in July, we've had a tremendous amount of wood smoke in, in our atmosphere in Thurston County from British Columbia. So in terms of adaptation, the strategy would be um, people who have chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder or youth with asthma, you want to keep them from being outside and being active that time of year. So an adaptation measure would be preventing people from complicating breathing conditions. Another would be with um, anticipated effects of warmer, wetter winters. We could expect um, larger, more frequent episodic flooding. So what does that mean for our transportation system and protecting people's homes and property? So thinking about adaptation strategies. Longer, drier summers. Um, a couple of years ago, we had the Scatter Creek fire um, out uh, near Rochester, Grand Mound area, and, and what that means that those types of things are things that we can anticipate over the next half a century of bec as becoming our new normal, things that we're expecting to deal with. So this climate adaptation plan um, identified 91 actions um, and recommendations um, throughout the Thurston region. And so this, this slide here just shows you a map of that planning area was because it was an EPA grant, it specified that our planning area was those watersheds that drain into the Puget Sound. So looking at this map, you can see that Tenino is outside of, of that watershed. Nonetheless, those actions identified in the plan are really a menu. I mean, they would be applicable to all of the Puget Sound lowlands, including the rest of the southwestern portion of Thurston County. And so here's just some examples of actions. Um, one would be sort of like increasing local government staff's awareness of best management practices for dealing with the effects of climate change and, and strategies to offset climate risks. Another would be um, having incentives to support energy efficiency and renew renewable energy investments in buildings, um, much like 
what I just read about in the paper with Tonino being nominated for an award for um, the innovative education, innovation education through renewables program um, with the solar power. So that would be sort of like an example of a, a type of climate mitigation or adaptation strategy and, and Tonino sort of modeling what that could be like for a smaller community. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, uh, risks to the transportation network such as flooding, landslide, and wildland fires. So um, we're now on to uh, climate mitigation planning. That's, that's our um, second prong here with our climate action plan. And as I mentioned, this is an effort that was really led by uh, the county, Lacey, Olympia, and Tumwater. And, and they all recently adopted resolutions recognizing the impacts of climate change and have um, committed to new targets, which, which I'll get to in here in a minute. But mitigation is really about addressing the, addressing the cause. Get in front of those impacts to try to minimize what those impacts would be by reducing the amount of um, greenhouse gas emissions that we generate here in Thurston County. And so this plan is specifically looking at greenhouse gas emissions that are generated here locally within Thurston County. So how we heat and cool our buildings, how we travel to work, meet our activities of daily living just here in our, in our, in our communities. It's really not looking at greenhouse gas emissions um, that we consume that are generated elsewhere. So for example, um, goods that we buy in the store that are shipped from China or blueberries that are grown in South America and we buy at Costco in February. We're not counting for the greenhouse gas emissions involved in growing and transporting those products here to our local markets. So just a little overview of the two phases. Phase one, um, which was led by TRPC working with the communities, um, was to assess each jurisdiction's goals um, try to get a reach a common baseline and common targets that they would work toward to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, sort of assessing what actions and steps that have already been taken. For example, like what has Lacey done to improve the energy efficiency in buildings? So, you know, sort of a low hanging fruit would be like swapping out all your, your light bulbs to LED light bulbs as an example. Um, so what I'd what I'd like to show you now is I'm about to show you some graphs and some numbers, and that tends to be really abstract. So what I'd like you to do is just kind of visualize what one metric ton of carbon dioxide looks like. And, and this is really one of the, the better images I could find out there on the internet. And, and what this is, imagine a balloon that's about 10 meters in diameter, which would be about 33 feet tall by 33 feet wide. That's one metric ton. So just just think about that in terms of what does a ton of CO2 look like. So looking at Thurston County, um, we have about, uh, in 2015, um, Thurston Climate Action Team, let me back up, Thurston Climate Action Team uh, did an inventory of greenhouse gas emissions generated in Thurston County. And for we're estimating for 2000, and they looked at it from 2010 through 2016. Um, our baseline is set for the year 2015, and there was approximately 2.84 million metric tons of carbon dioxide generated here locally in Thurston County. And so if we divide that up among the population, what that per capita would be, um, an average Thurston County is at about 10.9 metric tons per person per year. So that's about 11 of those big 10 meter diameter balloons that each person is generating, okay, to give you a sense. So how do we stack up and compare to other communities? Um, Seattle's, Seattle's uh, about half of Thurston County at 5.2, Eugene, Oregon, 5.6, um, King County, 9, Bellingham, 10.4, but compared to the rest of Washington State, 13.7 and the United States, 20.1. Thurston County, you know, we're, we're, we're doing fairly well overall and compared to other, other communities. Really? The reason we're not as low as, as we are, say, compared to Seattle, um, is they have much greater population density, a greater share of residents um, live in multifamily uh, structures, 
that tend to have better energy efficiency, lower cost to heat. Also, those communities tend to um, uh, use more renewable energy for powering their grid. Unlike here in Thurston County, where we still have a large share of our power being sourced from natural gas and coal. Did you have a question, John? You answered it. Okay. So when we talk about what are the source of the emissions, TCAP's report says that a lo the largest share come from building energy. Um, between commercial buildings and residential buildings, it's over 50%. So over 50% of the energy that we're using is, is coming from, from powering buildings. Um, second to that is really personal transportation. So cars and light duty trucks is 28%. So if you think about that, and, and then it, it kind of tapers off from there, you can see on this figure. Um, but if you think about those, those 10 meter diameter balloons of gas, this is, this is where it's coming from here in Thurston County. So the county and the cities adopted emissions targets to achieve 45% below 2015 levels by the year 2030. That's, that's 10 years away, folks. So we're trying to cut it in half, okay? Um, so you think about those big balloons. Each of you has... 10 of them, almost 11 of them, floating over your heads. On average, on average, okay, there's no finger pointing here. Just on average, you got 10 of those, 11 of those balloons floating over your head. We're basically saying in, in 11 years, we're gonna cut the number of those balloons by half, by each of us. So that's, that's pretty Herculean stuff that, that we're aiming for here. By the year 2050, an 85% reduction. So we're talking about the need to pretty substantially change the way we live our lives here in Thurston County, and so what is it going to take um, to get there? So that's the basis of this climate mitigation plan. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on this slide, so I'm going to kind of talk about it a little bit more, but um, we're looking for a, a broad public participation strategy from stakeholders. Like, that would include Tonino. That's why we're here tonight. We're here giving you an overview. There will be opportunities for Tonino to have a voice in this planning process. Um, but this plan does not directly affect Tonino governance. It's not going to um, prescribe to your community um, how you govern your community. I will say, though, that because unincorporated Thurston County and the cities are participating, it, it will indirectly affect Tanino residents because many Tanino residents um, travel and shop and work in unincorporated Thurston County and, and beyond in the cities up north. So in that way, yes, it will indirectly affect Tanino residents. Um, so this plan will identify actions. It'll prioritize those actions. It'll uh, both qualitatively and quantitatively assess the impacts of those actions. And, and then it will um, develop an implementation strategy that will be tailored to each of the communities as well as sort of a countywide strategy for implementing that plan. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more on the details of that here in a few slides down. So just to give you an overview of the planning framework, as I mentioned earlier, TRPC is the project manager, but there's several entities on this. As I mentioned, community engagement, public participation that will be ongoing throughout this planning process. So even though we're, we're having committee meetings and advisory work group meetings, uh, TRPC staff will be reaching out to like chambers of commerce, um, going to specific stakeholder groups and, and sharing information with you about what's going on with this planning process. So with that, think about how you would like TRPC and the project partners to keep you apprised of this process. You know, if, if you would like me or Allison to come down and periodically every other month or so give you an update, we'd be happy to do that. So at the heart of this, as I mentioned, the county and the cities, the jurisdiction partners, they're leading this process. This is their plan. Ultimately, um, the Board of County Commissioners and the city councils will be taking some form of action on this plan by the summer of 2020. Each of those jurisdictions has appointed um, one to two elected representatives to serve on the steering committee for this planning process. That's really the policy body that 
is driving and steering the overall direction of this planning process. That steering committee is accompanied with staff from those jurisdictions to help advise those policymakers on the process. Those staff are also regularly working with TRPC as part of a project team to just think about overall logistics and coordinating the efforts of the consultant team and thinking about our public outreach strategy and, and where we go and deliver information and, and seek input from the community. And then today, we held our very first advisory work group meeting at TRPC. That's about 30 plus members from the community that are subject matter experts that um, come from those sectors like building and energy, transportation and land use, agriculture and forestry, water and waste management, and cross-cutting actions that covers everything from um, education sector, Timberland Regional Library, youth, student voices. Um, we have a member from Thurston Climate Action Team, Tom Crawford, the president. And they're basically looking across all of these areas and making sure that there's coordination where we're leveraging efforts as well as providing their experience and input. So that advisory work group, their role really is to provide recommendations to the steering committee on the plan's visions, goals, and guiding principles, how we develop the plan, but also helping to um, identify criteria, and I'll, and I'll get to that in a minute, but also help develop actions and recommendations for the steering committee's consideration as to what actions go into that final plan. Oh, and, and of course the consultant team. Um, so TRPC has uh, established a contract with Cascadia Consulting Group out of Seattle, um, and Roel Hammerschlag, who's with Hammerschlag LLC, a, a local consultant in the Olympia area. So combined, they're, they're bringing many years of experience in working with communities from throughout the Pacific Northwest on developing climate action plans. So they're really our technical team that's gonna be helping to do a lot of the the qualitative and quantitative analysis with the actions that are being proposed in this process. So a little bit about the public engagement strategy.